Okay, so now we will attempt to prove this. And that if we want to integrate something, it is best if it proves to be the derivative of something with respect to arc length, right? So we could just use the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's what we're hoping for. And that's actually what happens here. What kappa is, is the derivative of the angle in which the curve points. And the direction of the curve is, of course, the direction of the tangent. And as the tangent goes around the curve with its changing arc length, its direction changes, and its direction can be measured by, an ang by the angle. And uh, the derivative of that angle, if we, can, if we call it gamma, and I'll have to specify it a little bit more, but what we're going to prove is that the derivative of gamma as a function of arc length and there are just at least three things that absolutely need to be addressed. First of all, when you see kappa, you have to ask, where is your choice of normal? Which choice of normal? Okay? And uh, I actually don't know, but I think if, if there is a God, this would be true if I choose the normal by saying that it's a counterclockwise 90 degree rotation from the tangent. That would be pretty, because then they form a positive set. We'll talk about orientation of sets later. And then things would be, so that's what I think it is, but, but we'll make sure. So that's number one. Number two, to have an angle, you need to have two vectors. And right now we only have one, which is the direction of the tangent. Okay, so it needs to be, there needs to be some reference direction. And so, again, we'll just introduce it arbitrarily. We'll just choose a vector, a unit vector, L, and we'll say that it's the angle between L and the tangent T. So that's our angle gamma. So if at some point, for example here, the unit tangent points in this direction, I'll choose a different point so it's not 90 degrees, okay? How about this point where the tangent points in this direction? I would say that the angle gamma, I would just bring this vector t to the reference direction L, and then this is the angle gamma. Okay, so that was easy. Like angle relative to what? That question is very easy to answer. It's relative to any arbitrarily uh, vector as long as it's selected a priori and is kept constant. Okay? So that's the second comment that we need to clarify here. And then the third comment is that you have to give this angle a sign, right? Because if we prove this formula, just think about what it means even for a circle of radius r. So let's say this is the relative direction, the reference direction. So for the point right here, right, where the tangent points in this direction, that angle would be zero. So gamma at this point is zero because our curve points in the same direction as the reference vector. So that would be zero. And then it would start growing, and it would start growing, and then right around here it'll be pi, right? And then if you keep going, it'll start diminishing again, right? Because if we're right about here, then the curve, in other words, the tangent vector points in this direction, and if we bring it here, right, it's again very small. Does that make sense? So the angle from this point starts at zero, then grows to pi, and then starts growing back to zero, dropping back to zero, but that's not what we want, because we're going to be integrating this and because we want to get 2 pi as the answer, we want the angle to keep growing. So it's not the angle in the sense of Euclid. Euclid would call this angle between this vector and the reference direction, would call it 30 degrees. Whereas we need to call it 330 degrees. Does that make sense? Because we want the angle to be growing. Or we can call it minus 30 degrees. So it's 
not just angle, it's signed angle with respect to L, or arithmetic angle with respect to L. That's the angle we need to consider. Right? The angle that starts from zero and grows to two pi, or maybe even becomes negative if the curve does this, for example, turns and starts going the other way, then we have to say that that angle is negative. So we're giving angle a sign. Okay, so that's the third common. That's the kind of angle that it needs to be. And then, and then the formula is correct. Otherwise, the formula would have to be plus or minus kappa, even if the direction of the normal is consistent. Okay, so let's prove that. So how are we going to prove that? Well, okay, so let's consider a curve. I'm going to draw it so that it goes slowly, so it goes in every which way. So we have like lots of different directions. And I will use red for the relative, okay, that's our relative, not relative, reference direction for the measuring of the angles. Okay, so for example, here is T, our tangent, and the unit normal will choose to point in the direction orthogonal to T, but also 90 degree counterclockwise direction. So that's how we're choosing our N. And then just for reference purposes, I'm bringing L over here. So that's how these three vectors are arranged here. And then here our angle is, our angle gamma is right here. And relative to L, it's positive. It's greater than zero. Okay? Because it's relative to L and because our positive direction is the counterclockwise direction, that's the way it goes. And then for the second point, typical point, let's pick this one. Now let me draw L again. And then let's look at this angle. So then the angle gamma is right here. And here, gamma is less than zero. You guys agree with me? Because T is on the other side of L. We only have one smooth operator at our disposal, and that's taking the derivative. So what you want to do is write down an identity that you can differentiate. And once you're done writing down the identity, then the rest is just a matter, a matter of technique. We know that the only way to do it is with the dot product. And what we can express is cosine of gamma. So cosine of gamma, because t is a unit vector, l is a unit vector, and so this dot product is the length of t, which is one, times the length of l, which is one, times the cosine of the angle between them, which is what we want. This formula doesn't care whether gamma is signed or not signed. That's the nature of cosine. So whether you made a blunder and didn't introduce sine gamma that's signed, G-N-E-D, this formula would still be correct. Okay? So that's not where that subtlety with it will enter. This formula is universal because cosine doesn't care whether it's 30 or a minus 30 or 330, or minus 390, all of those angles have the same cosine. So this formula, in that sense, is universal and doesn't care about the sine of gamma, okay? So now we have an identity. This depends on S, this de T depends on S, L does not depend on S. So, because it's a constant. So now I'm going to take derivatives of both sides. the curvature normal by definition, dotted with L. So, okay, again, we have unit vector dotted with the unit vector, so it's the length of N, which is one, times the length of L, which is one, times the cosine of the angle between them, times cosine. Let's figure out what the angle is. Let's, let's look, look here. here. The angle between N and L is this angle right here. I went right through my gamma, unfortunately. But it's clearly gamma plus pi over two. And here, when the arrangement is like this, here's our angle. And do you see that it's also gamma plus pi over two because of our sign convention, right? We're very tempted to say, 
pi over 2 minus gamma, but remember, gamma in this arrangement is negative. So it's just gamma pi over 2 plus gamma. And you will recall from your trig that this is minus sine of gamma. Right? And now we're just going to cancel this. Now you might say that with including the minus sign. Now you might just say, oh well, be careful, you might be canceling something that's equal zero, but that's actually not a problem because if it equals zero and, the, and it's not a straight section, it's just one point and uh, everything's, there. it's not a special point. There are no singularities and you can argue by continuity and smoothness that it continues to be the case. So minus signs canceled also, right? So there is a God uh, that <laughs> helped us, help for this to work out this way, okay? And so that completes the proof. The derivative of the angle with respect to any reference direction is the sine curvature kappa. And that's for the normal that's coordinated with the tangent in the, by the 90 degree counterclockwise, in other words, positive rotation. Okay, so the integral of kappa, I'm not even going to write down anything. I just said I will erase the doodles. You know, maybe it's the most beautiful of them all. Right, so when you're integrating sine curvature, <laughs> sorry, it's just so simple. I don't know what to say. Okay, sine sin curvature, curvature is the derivative of the angle. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, this integral, if, even if the curve is not closed, is final angle minus the initial angle. And so if the curvature, if the curve is closed once, then it's 2 pi. But if it does this twice, then it's 4 pi, and so on. And if the curve goes in the opposite direction, although we haven't quite discussed orientations and that sign, you might actually get minus 2 pi. Okay, so here's our seventh beauty. And this integral divided by 2 pi is called the turning number, which makes total sense. There is a related concept that I want to mention, but I'll save it for the homework, which is called the winding number. And it's how many times a curve goes around a chosen point. So you select this point, and then you consider a curve like this, right? So the turning number of this curve is probably three, right? Because you can trace one, two, I think three times it turns around itself. So if you evaluate this integral, you'll get six pi, you divide by two pi, you get three. So the turning number of this curve is three, and the turning number has nothing to do with what point you're considering. It's uh, just the property of the curve. But if you mark a point and you count how many times the curve goes around this point, that the answer here would be two, because it goes around this point twice. Like this is one time, one, and then doesn't matter what happens here, two. Does that make sense? So the winding number ignores this loop because it doesn't go around the point. And so a fun challenge is to express the winding number as a line integral like this, and that's on your homework. So here's our seventh beauty. Now let's have some pie.